entry that Jesus made into Jerusalem. Let us stand together as we join in these words of call to worship. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Come and see the King of glory sent by God to save his people.
come to this place this Palm Sunday to affirm those things which we believe. You'll find our uh, affirmation of faith today as the Apostle Creed found in your worship bulletin. Let us confess these things together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. this morning in the name of Christ.
excited. Let all of you adults know what's happening. So, wherever you are, look at a screen. church's website and you can also volunteer there and I am looking for anyone in here who has an excuse not to and I don't see anybody so we we'll hope you'll go there today so if anyone if there are any children in the um, congregation who are going to go to foundations and traditions you can go meet Me Miss Megan at the door and now it's the choir can also go out too And we now invite the Hart family to come forward for a special baptism. Dearly beloved, Baptism is an outward and visible sign of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, through which grace we become partakers of his righteousness and heirs of life eternal. Those receiving the sacrament are thereby marked as Christian disciples and initiated into the fellowship of Christ's holy church. Our Lord has expressly given to little children a place among the people of God whose holy privilege must not be denied them. Remember the words of Jesus Christ, how he said, Let the little children come to me, I know, and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Andy, Becky, if you all will kind of stand over here just for a moment. 
there are several questions that I need to ask the two of you. First of all, do you confess your faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Do you therefore accept as your bounden duty and privilege to live before him a life that becomes the gospel, to exercise all godly care, that he be brought up in the Christian faith, that he be taught the holy scriptures, and that he learn to give reverent attendance upon both the private and the public worship of Almighty God? Will you do that? Yes. Will you endeavor to keep him under the ministry and guidance of the church until he, by the power of God, shall accept for himself the gift of salvation? and be confirmed as a full and responsible member of Christ's Holy Church. I think he's asking the same <laughs> question, so will you do that? Yes, All right, may I have him, please? Hey, buddy. How you doing? <laughs> what name is to be given this child? Jensen Alexander. Jensen Alexander Hart. I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, I'm just going to turn you around a little bit. Okay, I may not go anyplace. Uh, <laughs> Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, once again, we've had the privilege of baptizing a child and declaring to him the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. A grace that we pray not only will take root in him, but that will grow and increase and blossom and flourish through all of the years uh, as he grows up. Uh, he's going to need our influence, though. He needs us to help uh, shape him. His parents have already made their part of the covenant. God has already made uh, God's part of the covenant. Now you and I have an opportunity to share in that covenant to help raise him in the Christian faith. So if you will join me in, in helping to influence him for Jesus Christ, will you simply say with me, with God's help, we will. With God's help, we will. Kathy. Let us pray. Oh God, our Heavenly Father, grant that Jensen and Alexander, as he grows in years, may also grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that by the restraining and renewing influence of the Holy Spirit, he may ever be a true child of thine, serving thee faithfully all his days. So guide and uphold Andy and Becky that by loving care, wise counsel, and holy example, they may lead him into that life of faith whose strength is righteousness and whose fruit is everlasting joy and peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Uh, I have here a copy of his uh, baptismal certificate. And also there's a letter in here that I'd like to ask you to have him open on his 12th birthday. Will you do that? Mm -hmm. God bless you. Thank you so much. Will you hold that? You want to hold it? It's yours. Okay, would you hold that for him? <laughs> Thank you. God bless you. You may be seated. Welcome to worship on this Palm Sunday to Dunwoody United Methodist Church. It's a pleasure to worship with you today. If you haven't already done so, I invite you to find the pew pads located on the end of each pew. If you will fill that out, then pass it down the aisle. When it reaches the end, you can pass it back so you know who you're worshiping with this morning and maybe learn a new name. If you turn to page 7 of your bulletin, our highlighted ministry today is the prayer ministry. Prayer ministries are a vital and essential part of every congregation, and we treasure ours at this congregation. I hope you'll read that announcement and learn how you can get more involved in prayer ministry here at Dunwoody. This congregation is building a habitat house at the end of this month in one week, and we need all the help we can get in order to make that happen. If you go to the church's website, you can sign up there, and we hope that you will, and we hope to see you at the end of this month at the habitat site. Today at 3 o'clock is the final performance of Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. It is in the Fellowship Hall, 
Everyone who has been there gives it wonderful reviews. It lasts just over an hour, so children are welcome. We hope you will join the drama ministry for its final performance today. This marks the beginning of Holy Week. Each day this week, Monday through Friday, we have a 12.05 service in this space. Immediately following that service, we will have a free lunch in the Fellowship Hall, which you are more than welcome to attend. And on Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday, we also have nighttime services. On page seven of the bulletin is all of the times and places for the services. And don't forget that this week, instead of Wednesday night supper, we have Thursday night supper. So we'll see you on Thursday night for that. Then a week from today, we'll gather back in the space to celebrate Easter. We have four services at 8 o'clock, 9, 10, 10, 15, and 11, 20. It will be a wonderful time of celebration, and we hope that you and your family will come join us that day. Let us continue to worship. As we move into our time of prayer, I invite you to turn in your bulletins to page 6 to find the concerns and celebrations of our congregation. have some names that I would like to add this morning if you would like to take this home with you and pray for these people throughout the week. We would also like to include Del Birch, Bonnie Neal, 
and Kay King among our prayers. And this morning we give our Christian sympathy to Charlene and Bob Levinson on the death of her mother Lucille Pat Sams. We pray for Laura McElroy and her family on the death of her father William Jerry Head, the grandfather of Andrew James and Sarah. And we pray for Lauren and Todd Reagan on the death of Lauren's father, Croby Olento, grandfather of Benjamin and Mary Ellen. Let us now go into a time of prayer together. Loving and gracious God, this morning we celebrate your son's arrival into Jerusalem. His triumphal entry was not what anyone expected. Rather than appear as a conqueror, Jesus, you came into the city seeking only to serve and to bear witness to the sacrificial love of the Father. Rather than bringing an army, you brought a message of peace and humbleness. Rather than seize an earthly throne by force, you took your place on a heavenly throne through your submission to death on the cross. No matter how often we hear this story, God, we struggle to grasp the mystery of a crucified Messiah. And yet, despite how short we fall in our understanding, Lord, we offer our thanks and our praise for this glorious gift of salvation that comes to each and every one of us without price. Loving and gracious God, this morning we also remember your son's humiliation and crucifixion. We remember that the Hosanna is lifted today, will soon be turned into cries of judgment, and that the path that is this morning strewn with palm branches will soon be marked by thorns. So as we begin this holy week, we pray, God, that you would quiet our minds, give peace to our hearts, enable us to follow the steps of Jesus and to more fully appreciate the way of the cross. For Jesus, you knew that the end of your journey would be defined by suffering, and you even warned those of us who would follow you that our own lives would encounter storms and struggles. Sometimes those storms would be like the literal storms faced by so many this morning. And the winds and the rain are terrifying. The wreckage can be overwhelming. Other times, though, God, the storms rage in the hidden places. Our hearts, our minds, our spirits, anxiety, confusion, despair, these things can hold us captive. But you speak peace to the storms within and without. You bring freedom to those of us who are imprisoned. You shine light when all seems dark. You bring hope when all seems lost. And even in the face of death, you usher in a newness of life that restores us and makes us whole. We pray for a spirit of resurrection in our lives and in the life of Dunwoody United Methodist Church. We ask God that you would speak to us and guide us, that you would revive us and strengthen us for the days ahead, that you would remind us that even those things we have buried in a tomb can still come alive, can still be set free. Lord, we pray for all of those in our community this morning who need your healing. We give thanks for the joy of baptism and we ask for the comfort of your presence to be with those who are experiencing loss. And now God of life and love, hear us as we pray together in one voice the words that your son taught us saying, our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Good morning. Please stand as you are able for the reading of the scripture lesson. The lesson for today comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 15, verses 40 through 42 through 47, beginning on page 1241 in the Red Pew Bibles. Since it was late in the afternoon on preparation day, just before the Sabbath, Joseph from Arimathea dared to approach Pilate and ask for Jesus' body. Joseph was a prominent council member who also eagerly anticipated the coming of God's kingdom. Pilate wondered if Jesus was already dead. He called the centurion and asked him whether Jesus had already died. When he learned from the centurion that Jesus was dead, Pilate gave the dead body to Joseph. He bought a linen cloth, took Jesus down from the cross, wrapped him in the cloth, and laid him in a tomb that had been carved out of rock. He rolled a stone against the entrance to the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was buried. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Will you stand for the benediction? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> don't, don't, don't do that. Some of you who want to get home to see the masters, you're thinking, man, that would have been really good. Uh, thank you for your presence this morning. Choir, thank you so much. How beautiful. All the choirs this morning, the children, youth, everybody's done a wonderful job, haven't they? And uh, I'm so grateful. Will you bow with me for just a moment of prayer? Our gracious and loving God, now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together be acceptable to you. O Lord, our strength and our everlasting redeemer. Amen. Well, Carol and I have a nephew by the name of Michael. When he was just a little baby, we would hold him in our arms, and we were there sort of when he was born. But today, he's a grown man, he's married, and he has two children. He's uh, a captain in the army with the rangers. He's tall, dark, and about as handsome as you get. He's strong. He's a, he's a person of deep character and, and faith. He's also a very nice guy, about as nice as you can get. He's quiet, reserved, and polite. He treats everybody with respect. He's the kind of person that really everybody in this room would just naturally like. And, and to meet him today, you would just kind of have this impression that he's just always sort of been like this. You wouldn't know that he has a backstory, but when he was just a little guy, he had what I guess child psychologists today would call he was a strong-willed child. In everyday vernacular, he was a terror, which I would remind you is just three letters short of terrorist. I mean, you could look at him and you could say, no, and he'd get that gleam in his eye and he'd do what you told him not to do just to see your reaction. And if you ever told, if you ever tried to get him to do something that he didn't want to do, he would, he would, you know, scream and throw himself on the floor. He'd throw his arms, his legs in every direction. And, and I can hear some of you thinking to yourself right now, well, Dan, you've just described every toddler that's ever lived. And that's true. But Michael was sort of that to the max. I remember once when his family came to visit our house. He was in my son's bedroom, and, and uh, they lived up north in Maryland, and, and he, he was in my son's bedroom, and, and uh, he was spitting on my son's bed. Now, I was actually in another part of the house, but I heard Carol say, Michael, don't do that. And knowing what I knew about Michael, I decided to find out what was going on. And when I came into the room and saw what he was doing, I got involved. Probably shouldn't have, but I did. And I said, uh, I looked at him and I said, Michael, don't do that again. And he got that gleam in his eye. And he turned and he spit not once, but twice on the bed. And have you ever had one of those moments when your emotion just kind of rose up in you like an irresistible tide? And so as one motion, I swept him up in my arms, and I walked down the hallway to the bathroom, and I sat him down on the toilet. I put the toilet seat down first before I did that, but, <laughs> but I sat him down on the toilet seat, and, and then I did what no rational adult should ever do. I looked him in the eye, and calmly but firmly said, Michael, we're not leaving this bathroom until you say I'm sorry. I don't care if it takes one hour, one day, one week, one month, one decade. We're not leaving until you say I'm sorry. And the moment those words leapt out of my mouth, I thought, oh dear Lord, what have you just done to yourself? Because <laughs> I could kind of imagine myself being there for a decade, you know, and, and Parenthetically, that was 30 years ago. I'd handle a situation very differently today than, than I did that day. But for about the next hour or hour and a half, Michael and I sat in that bathroom. And every few moments, his parents would come and check on us. They came not because they were worried about Michael. They came because they were worried about what Michael was going to do to me. And, and, and then... You know, every few minutes I would say to him, Michael, all you have to do is say I'm sorry, and, and it's over. 
But he was as strong-willed as I am. And so as I say, we sat there for about an hour and a half. But finally, thank God, he uttered those words and the episode was over. And later when his family returned back home to Maryland, they, uh, and Michael would get into trouble, they would threaten him by saying, how would you like to go to Uncle Dan's house for the week? <laughs> Well, as I say, that's, that's sort of the way Michael was during his growing up years. But today, he's entirely different. You see, there came a moment in Michael's life where he came under the influence of someone and it began a process of transformation in his life. I couldn't help but think about him this week as I was reflecting on our scripture lesson this morning because in our scripture lesson this morning, we read the story of another man who underwent a, a transformation. Granted, his transformation was very different than the one my nephew Michael underwent, but it was still a transformation. And His name was Joseph. He was from the little town of Arimathea. Now, the town of Arimathea no longer exists, but the best guess is that it was located somewhere up in the northwestern hills of what today uh, is Israel. Sometime during his young adult years, Joseph moved from Arimathea to, to Jerusalem. And while we don't know exactly what his field was, we do know that he was very successful. Matthew tells us that he was a, a very wealthy man. We also know that he was very well thought of because Luke tells us that he was a good and a righteous man. And both Mark and Luke uh, tell us that he eagerly anticipated the coming of God's kingdom. And so he was no doubt this very devout individual, and if Jerusalem were putting together a blue ribbon committee for something, his would probably have been one of the names at the very top of that list of, of the blue ribbon committee. In fact, so well thought of was he that at one point he was elected to one of the most uh, prestigious religious bodies in the entire land. He was elected to the ruling Sanhedrin. And as you know, the, the ruling Sanhedrin were the ones who condemned Jesus to death. But it's what John tells us, the Gospel of John tells us, that really sticks in the mind. You see, John tells us that he was a secret disciple of Jesus. And you can almost picture the scene, can't you? One day this religious and civic leader hears about Jesus. He hears about some of the things that he said. He hears about some of the things that he's done. And so he decides to go and check it out for himself. Perhaps he was there that day when Jesus fed the 5,000. Or maybe he was there that day when the scribes and the Pharisees took a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery and threw her at Jesus' feet. And he heard Jesus say, let the one who was without sin be the first to cast a stone. Or maybe, maybe he was there that day when Jesus uttered those words, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Whenever it was that Joseph encountered Jesus, there was something about Jesus that touched his heart. He wanted to hear more from Jesus. He wanted to, to see more of what Jesus was doing. He, he wanted to begin to live more the way that Jesus lived. But he had to be careful. Because for him, to be identified with Jesus could be very costly. It could cost him a standing in the Sanhedrin. It could cost him financially. It could cost him his reputation. And so John tells us that he became a secret disciple of Jesus. Then comes the passion. And when Jesus was arrested and then hauled before the, the Sanhedrin, we're told that Joseph tried to speak up for him. No doubt he did it subtly. Again, he's trying to be very careful. 
but his words fell on deaf ears. Instead, they condemned him, and as you know, he was beaten, and, and, and later he was led out to Calvary. And then comes the crucifixion. Crucifixions were very public events. They were held where everybody can see them, and we can only imagine what it must have been like. We can only imagine that many of those who were there on that Palm Sunday when Jesus came riding into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey and, and they hailed him as king of the Jews, now, now they turned their heads in disgust. And then came Jesus' death. And normally, when someone was crucified, their body was left on the cross until they needed the cross for someone else. Or in the case of a Jew and in the case of the Sabbath, they would take the bodies down and they would just leave them in a heap at the foot of the cross. But for Joseph, this was a transforming moment. Mark tells us that in response to this experience, this one who had been a secret disciple of Jesus now dared to go boldly to Pilate to ask for the body of Jesus. Mark tells us that this one who was so careful about being identified with Jesus now went and bought a linen cloth and, and tenderly took the body of Jesus down from the cross and wrapped it in that linen cloth. And Mark tells us that this one who had so much to lose generously gave perhaps his most prized possession, the family tomb that had been carved out of the stone. Now why? Why would Joseph do this? Why would the secret disciple suddenly become a courageous one? What was it that ignited his tenderness and his generosity? People are transformed in many different ways and for many different reasons. Sometimes it happens the way it did for my nephew Michael. Sometimes they come under the influence of someone who helps to shape their lives and change them. Sometimes it happens the way it did for me. Uh, a pastor or someone like that loves you through a very painful time in your life. The gospel writers don't tell us why it was that Joseph was transformed, but they do imply that it had to do with the cross, that there was something about what he saw, something about what he experienced that impacted his heart in such a way that he went away from the cross a different person than he had come. Perhaps, perhaps as he looked at the cross, he saw the length to which we can descend. He saw the depth to which sin can cause us to descend. Often today, I think, we sometimes have a tendency to sanitize sin, to trivialize it or treat it as if it's no big deal. We, uh, instead of calling adultery, adultery, we speak of affairs. In private company, we sometimes tell jokes that are hurtful and painful to other people. We play power politics and, and we turn a blind eye to the damage that they've done. It's done. Sometimes we deceive people and we speak of it as just a little white lie. But every now and then, every now and then, something happens. And we see what sin can do in people's lives. We see a family come apart at the seams because of infidelity. Or we see a person who has become captured by some addiction of one kind or another and they become a parody of what God intended for that human being 
to be. Or we learn of someone who walks into an African-American church in Charlottesville or a synagogue in Pittsburgh or a mosque in New Zealand and lets loose a barrage of bullets and, and suddenly it all begins to be clear. We begin to see the reality of what sin can do in our lives and in the world. And socially, I, I can't help but wonder if that's something of what Joseph saw, experienced that day as he stood at the foot of the cross. I, I can't help but wonder. He, he knew the miracles that Jesus had performed. He had heard Jesus talk of love. He had seen how Jesus treated everybody with respect and dignity. He knew that Jesus didn't deserve to die. In fact, he knew that if there was anyone, anyone who taught us about humility and virtue and forgiveness and loving those who are poor and mar marginalized and vulnerable, that person was Jesus. And yet, he watched how the, politi the politics played out. And, and the powers that be helped to put Jesus on the cross. But maybe there was something about that that touched his heart, that changed him forever. Or perhaps, perhaps as he looked at the cross, he saw that Jesus' death had a meaning that went beyond that of any other human being that ever has or ever will walk the face of this planet. Every day, people die. 151,600 every day. 6,317 every hour. 105 every minute. Nearly two every second. And every person's life counts, and every person's death matters. Or if it doesn't, it, it ought to. But Jesus' life and death somehow went beyond that of any other human being. We speak of B.C. and A.D. before Christ, Antonio Domini, in the year of the Lord. And the science world, to be politically correct, has, has changed it now to uh, BCE and CE, before Common Era and, and Common Era. But the point is still the same. The Christ event stands at the very center of human history. And his death has a meaning that impacts all of us. This week I've been meeting with some of the young people who are to be confirmed two weeks from today. They'll be joining the church and making a profession of their faith in Jesus Christ. And One of the things that we've been talking about is redemption, what it means to be redeemed by Christ. And I've, to try and help them understand, I've used a very, very inadequate illustration, but I try, I've tried to get them to imagine me giving them a coupon and then taking that coupon and just going to a, a store and turning that coupon in and the, and the clerk would just give them a $5 bill. And, uh, and at that point, by the way, their eyes kind of brighten up a little bit. They kind of think I'm going to give them one of those coupons. But I've tried to help them understand that when they turn that coupon in, they're redeeming that coupon. You do that with coupons at the store sometimes, some of you. You redeem your coupons. And, and it's that exchange that is the redemption. And I try to help them see that that's what Jesus has done for us. He's offered his life. He's given of himself sacrificially so that we might experience life abundant and life eternal. 
We don't know what it was that Joseph saw experienced that day at the cross. Maybe it was the fact that he saw the length to which God's love was willing to go. Maybe, maybe he saw that Jesus didn't just suffer the cross, but that he actually embraced the cross. He laid down his life for ours. But whatever it was, he left the tomb, left, left the cross, a different man than he had come. He was transformed. Which leads me to the question that I really want to ask you this morning. What is there in your life that needs transforming? And please note that I didn't ask if your life needed transforming. Every single one of us in here have something in our lives that needs the transforming power of Jesus Christ. What is it in your life? Maybe there's a destructive habit. Maybe there's a fear of some kind and you need to let go of that to find peace. Maybe, maybe there's been a broken relationship and resentment has filled your heart and you need the cleansing power of Christ. Maybe there's a dark spot or a secret sin that, that just has you captured and you need release from it. What is it in your life? May I suggest to you that whatever it is, you can find the transforming power of Christ at the foot of the cross. You have only to take it and surrender it to Christ to let him begin his work in your heart and in your mind. Oh Lord, let it be. Let us pray. And let me invite you to do something this morning. As we prepare to pray, why don't you just take your hands and put them on your lap and put your palms upward. Put yourself in a position of being able to receive what Christ has to give. Our gracious and loving God, we all come to you from different places with different gifts and graces, but also with, with different experiences of brokenness and need. We pray you will forgive us of those parts of our lives where we have failed or where we have turned our backs on you or rebelled against your love. We pray that in those places of brokenness and need, you will bring healing to our hearts. And in the closing moments of this service, please, dear God, begin your transforming work where it has yet to begin and continue it where it has already started. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn is listed there in your bulletin, I Surrender All. As we stand and sing this hymn, I'd like to open the doors of the church to anyone who would like to come forward and join the church, whether by a profession of your faith or a transfer of your membership. Will you stay in this together, we sing.
thank you for your presence this morning. When you go from this place, go in the knowledge Christ is going before you, beside you, and he'll be with you every step of the way. Now the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be in you and with you and fill you today, tomorrow, and for the rest of your life. Amen.